Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same months. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses whereon they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord." And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall Put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth, un, eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this same self day have I brought you armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month of the fourteenth day of the month at even ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass... When ye be come into the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, and he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh 
that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, and their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they bowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians." And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, and even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of dough, of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the same self day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generations. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it, and when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and let them come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is home born, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses so and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass, the same self day, that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the, arm, out of the land of Egypt by their armies. And so last week, what I'm, what I'm talking about today actually, is the first mention you'll look in verse 3 is this word, the congregation. We're talking about the congregation today. So last week we talked about Daniel and this, this kind of revelation or this statement has been sort of brewing in my heart and that's based on Daniel's experience. Today's decisions are become the reflexes of tomorrow. So decisions we make today become our reflexes tomorrow. And so I made the decision long ago, and I've, and I've held and I've, I've stated this time and time again. I've been, I've been firm with people. I've been uh, sometimes a little harsh with people, a little hard on people. And that the statement holds true, and I, and I believe it today as much as I believed it last week, and that's YouTube is not church. Live stream is, is not church. Okay? Now, many are saying that it can be, or, or perhaps it's best right now. Okay? <clears throat> Some of the reasons that are being given as, as to why for a time it would be acceptable to not congregate, but rather to use social media and live streaming technologies to have church are, are, are as follows, and I believe are, are, are thrust away by the exact scenario that Daniel experienced. Now some will say that they're okay with the government strongly suggesting that we stay home 
instead of going to church because there's a, there's a foreseeable end to it. So because the government has only said it's two weeks, there's a foreseeable end, there's a deadline to it, then we're okay with that. We're going to close the doors of the church house, the meeting house, and we're going to live stream and say, well, if you recall it, Daniel had a 30-day deadline to his requirement to not pray to anyone but to King Nebuchadnezzar. And yet Daniel stood. Also, the decree that came, and this is the same argument that I've heard presented, was that we're okay with this because it's not like the government is just picking on churches to not congregate together. They're saying that the sports is sports entertainment will be closed. They're saying that that the bars will be closed. They're saying that that um, unnecessary um, shopping stores are going to be closed. Right. So the decree went and was aimed at everyone, but was not the charge given to Daniel the same, where everyone in the whole kingdom would, for those 30 days, not pray to anyone but King Nebuchadnezzar. And yet Daniel stood and prayed three times a day as he was wont to do. So they say, okay, well, since it's only for a time, then we can close the doors. Oh, since it's armed at everybody, then we can close the doors. They're also saying that biblical, or that, that quarantine and separation is biblical, and it's found in an example of Leviticus chapter 13. And yet I went through Leviticus chapter 13, and do you know what I found? I didn't find everybody staying in their own home as quarantine. I found a priest looking, and I looked, and, I, and I, I highlight every time in blue that I saw, look, the priest shall look on him. He shall consider him. He shall see him. When he sees him, when he looks, in his sight, when he looks, when he looks, when he looks, then shall he shut up him that hath the plague, when he sees the plague upon him. Amen. Okay? This is not a blanket everyone quarantine themselves. The quarantine was for him that has a visible issue to be separate from the congregation so that they can still meet safely. The congregation was being protected from the one that was put up, shut up because he had the plague. That was what was to take place biblically. Verse 46, it also says, all the days wherein the plague shall be on him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his singular habitation be. And so to say that, God, that, that, that by biblical principle we have reason to not congregate and rather stay at our homes and live stream, I stand by it. YouTube is not church. Nor is there any biblical mandate to do so. Daniel stood, even though there was a timeline to the decree. Daniel stood, even though that it was aimed at everyone and it was consistent. And the, the discernment is a visual look for the, the problem, the, the defect on somebody, the uncleanness on somebody, and that man is to be separated. Now, I'm trying to be respectful in all this because there's very difficult times in front of us. And we've already been through some, okay? And so these men of God are set with a decision to make. And they've all made their own unique decisions. But my conviction is that as we did a four time, as I did a four time, that's what I have to keep on doing. Biblically speaking, I think this is a Daniel in the lion's den scenario. The, the government has said, not by decree yet, by firm suggestion, that we're to do a certain thing. We're to separate ourselves and not congregate from any, uh, they say, non-essentials. Well, I think church is essential. Amen. Amen. And so, and so there, there I stand. And this is, this is the position that I've made. Of course, we have made, we have made provision and, and we've given the same, the same charge that we've always given to everybody is that if you feel sick, stay home. If you think you're at risk, stay home. We're not legalists in that every single day you must be in church. And you know that. We practice that. My son is, is, is prone to getting sick almost repeatedly throughout the wintertime. Cold and flu season comes, and he just catches this stuff like a sponge. And so and him, and, and by extension, my wife stay home quite often in the winter, unfortunately. But that is biblical 
containment. That is biblical quarantine, according to Leviticus. We see the runny nose. We see the sniffling. We see the coughing. And for the sake of the congregation that will meet without fail, we quarantine the one, the two, the three, whosoever has the actual plague upon them. Now, we can continue on. And the thing that I noticed was that the first mention of the congregation in the, in the whole Bible, it's here in Exodus chapter 12. Now, like I said, I don't believe church or the congregation to be a non-essential meeting. I believe it's mandated by God. And I actually believe I don't even have the right to close the congregation for a scenario like this. Now, we closed the church for weather before, but you know what that was? That was the, the priest seeing a problem and making a decision to, to not assemble. Okay? There was a visual enemy. <laughs> It was, it was a f like three feet of snow in Canada, right? Okay. But for an unseen, undiagnosed, un invisible enemy, I don't believe we're given the mandate because the mandate comes from God. And so if I'm going to say, okay, and this is going to sound like I'm pushing the boundaries a little bit, but if, if I make the decision to say church is off, I have just spoken contrary to the law of God. And the congregation should look at me for making that decision and go, well, what in the world? We're, we're commanded to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much the more as we see the day approaching. And how many of us have sat there today and said, whoa, I see the day approaching. Amen. <laughs> okay? So I, I don't have the authority to, to stop the assembly. Okay? That's, that's my conviction. You know, greater men than I have made the decision to do so. But I just, I, I'm just, I'm just, I don't even know. I've always been resolved that when God says it, I do it for the most part, no matter the consequences in areas like this, because I'm not, I'm not smart enough or capable enough or, or what have you enough to, to make decisions like that and, and to stand by them. I just, my life is simpler. I have fewer decisions to make for myself when I just let God make the decision. Amen. And he says, be in church. So the beginning of months, look at verse 2 there in Exodus chapter 12. At the very beginning, now this isn't Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created. But if you read from Genesis, you'll find that a family is gradually grown up to be where we're at right now. Genesis, Exodus. So once we roll over from Genesis to Exodus, we go from a family being discussed to a family that's gotten so massive that they're a nation. Okay, As was promised to Abraham so long ago. So things are starting here. As far as human government, human um, cities, human uh, social uh, aspect, and all that kind of thing. It's starting now, and that's indicated in verse 2. It says, This month shall be unto you a beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. He's kicking it off. This is the beginning of months. This is, this is day one, essentially. And he says this in the very first statement of the beginning of months. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel. So as soon as God hits the go button, he hits play, he immediately addresses who? Not a family, but the congregation of the children of Israel. Now, they're told here to take a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a household, right? So the congregation, and as I was reading this, my brain's just going off of all sorts of ways I could have taken this, but <clears throat> the congregation takes a lamb. And if you look over in verse 11, it says, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded so they're prepared to go. They're dressed. And with shoes on your feet and with staff in your hand. Not only are they dressed, their shoes are on and they're ready to proceed. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Profound statement. I love when he says it. I am the Lord. It means he's in charge. He's giving them the ordinance of the Lord's Passover. Look what it says in verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses wherein ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. So now we see 
not a quarantine, but we see the congregation comes together and is giving commands for that night when they go home. And we're going to come together and we're going to go home to our own houses, right? We don't, we don't congregate where we all, you know, have a commune where we live in. But this was what the children of Israel was given. At the kickoff of the beginning of months, the congregation is addressed. They're told to take a lamb and the lamb's blood is shed as a token that the plague shall not come nigh thee. Our greatest plague is sin and hell, right? And how did we get out of sin and hell? We took the lamb and accepted his blood as a submission, as a sacrifice for us. We believed on him and trusted him. I just, I found it interesting. Again, the first mention of congregation of the church is coupled with the first month ever on their calendar and the taking of a lamb and the shedding of his precious blood. You know what that tells me? It tells me that the congregation, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and his precious blood are forever by tight conjoined. Meaning that the congregation and the precious blood of Jesus Christ are conjoined forever. By type here in the Old Testament. Now, have I had liberties here in just taking congregation and church and just passionate at the same thing. Hebrews 2 verse 12 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. You can check it later. Psalm 22 verse 22 is what's being quoted there in the New Testament. And he says, in the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. God's showing by continuance. And that's not the only spot. That the church and the congregation are similar. They're the same thing. Different opportunities, different aspects, different charges. But nevertheless, the church was where praise was being referred to, being sung to God way back in Psalm 22. And he said that in Hebrews. Go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Again, I'm not just having liberties and just taking some Old Testament principle and just applying it to the new. But I have New Testament giving clarity unto the Old Testament principle and it says this, Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who, re who received the lively oracles and gave unto us. Okay? This is saying that Moses, when he received that oracle and proclaimed that truth way back in the wilderness, which is just a little bit past Exodus chapter 12, this was the church, the congregation. Same thing. This is that same Moses giving that same statement, walking with that angel, and it's called to light as the church and revealed to as such. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 20, we're going to continue. So I just made those statements because I wanted to get them off my chest about the, the, the congregation not being optional, not being unessential. It's absolutely essential, just so everybody's familiar and knows where I stand on this thing. And fortunately or unfortunately, however you put it, and I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm some, some tough guy, okay? If there was 51 people in this room, we would still be congregating, okay? It's not my choice to make. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Again, the cause made that the church is connected now to the blood of Christ. By type, Exodus chapter 12 brings that into, into the same revelation. Now, in verse 27, you see, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And that is ultimately my biggest desire. 
to, to not shun to declare something just because it's unpopular, just because we know of another pastor that has a different opinion, because, because we've heard something differing all our lives, or to, to hide from you certain things that are unpopular or un, un, uh, unfavored in this world or among friends of ours or among other churches or what have you. I believe all the counsel of God should not be shunned from declaring, okay? And that is my desire. Now, it says that the church of God was purchased with his own blood. And so again, this is something that is not just not essential. This is something that is inseparable. That is something that is of utmost importance. This is something that is so essential to Christ that he was willing to give it all for. And that is his shed precious blood when he died. Verse 29 says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves, and look at this, enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And so you have to think to yourselves about how, if we're all on the internet and connected in that way, someone is going to enter in among you. Now we know that via technology that has happened where somebody spends too much time listening to sermons from somebody on the internet and that changes their mind towards uh, maybe a belief of the church or a certain understanding of scripture and they start to write. So someone that is grievous can enter in through somebody else. But if we are together and meeting together and this is where this is the purchased blood um, church of God that we've chosen to assemble in then the grievous wolves shouldn't be just infecting our minds. They, should, they, they would actually have to come in here. They would actually have to meet here. It says, also of your own self shall men arise, speaking for verse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. So that's given credence to the idea that this is a physical place. Somebody is in danger. We're in danger of having somebody enter in to the flock, which is a congregation of sheep. And the danger and fear is that they would draw away people from the flock, from the congregation. Verse 31, it says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so... While I believe it's okay at this time when the decisions are being made to by these pastors to, to, to do what they will with their congregation. The danger that's being highlighted shows a physical church gathering. Danger is someone entering in, drawing somebody away. And now because of technology, like I said, that can be done without actually physically being here. And so contrary opinions can enter into a church and in danger, they can, they can cause danger for some of you carried away. Anyways, it says, so watch and remember. And, and so I've, I've, I've done that. We may be gracious now to people who are canceling the congregation. We may be gracious now to people giving completely uh, unscriptural, rested scriptural reasons for doing so. But Paul says, watch and remember, okay? And so while I have been gracious to people that I've heard say such things and decide such things, I won't forget it, okay? That's just something that, that I've said to, said to my heart that I'm going to remember that things were said. See, in my opinion, I've seen a presentation from, from this guy. He's got like 14,000 views, and he's a Kentucky Baptist preacher. And he came out, and he gave all the worldly reasons the, the, the disease stats, and then he gave the testimonies of Protestants of history when the Spanish flu came in. And so he says, because of history, because of the stats, because of this, this is why I made the decision. And I honestly have more respect for somebody coming to the decision from a worldly standpoint than I do a Christian standing up and making the scripture say something that they don't. Right? If, if, if you want to stay home because you're scared of the, of the virus, then just say you're scared of the virus. But, but don't tell me that the Bible teaches you that that's what's right. 
Watch and remember is what Paul charged. And, and he had this heart and love for the church. He, he had this care for the church such that he stayed with them and suffered with them and ceased, to, ceased not to warn every man night and day with tears. And that love, that heart from his, from his heart to his people came from the same heart and love for God. Now why? Why is this all so important? Yes, Christ gave his blood for the church. Yes, it was referred to way back in the foundations of, of, of essentially the first of months for the children of Israel when they began to be the congregation. But why is it so important? 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Church is so important because it is the pillar, it is the ground of the truth. That means it's the base, it's that firm foundation, it's that solid rock that you build upon. It's also as the pillar, the stanchion, whereby all other things are built and held up. And so the church, as the house of God, as the church of the living God, is that pillar and ground of all truth. Now, Paul brings up this point. He says, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave. In other words, there's a particular behavior that is expected in this pillar, in this ground. Meaning that, meaning that there is a particular order of things. There's a particular way of things that they ought to be done. How you ought to behave yourself, it should be evident and it is clear. He comes back and he's going to eventually say, if I tarry long. So I bet you he was going to bring more teaching on these things. But what we do see from that statement is that there's an order. Yes, bishops, deacons, pastors, and the like, right? These are different structures that are given. And I think the, the statement is here for the purpose of showing that our life should be built upon not the leadership that you have, but the order should be built upon the congregation itself, the order of the church. Essentially, church should be the foundation of everything that you do in your life. It's the base camp. It's the congregation. It's the place that you meet and you gather and you charge up so that you can go out and do these things. Now, these members that are here, our services, our fellowships, our, our special engagements, and these types of things that happen, they need to be the foundation of our lives, according to the Apostle Paul here. It needs to be a place where you can grow in faith. If you look across in chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Now, there are other spirits in the latter times who are just itching to seduce believers and God's people with other spirits and other doctrines. He wants to draw away disciples after himself. That, that false lying seducing spirit wants to draw away people from the congregation, the church, this church needs to be your foundation. It needs to be your center. It needs to be your heart. It is the very pillar and the ground of the truth. It, 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 it speaks to its rigidity. It speaks to its tangibleness. What's, what's the ground? I mean, you know, when you find bedrock, it doesn't move. It's solid, and that's where, you, that's where you launch your pillar so it can bear up against it. Pillars shouldn't move, especially once you've built upon that pillar your faith, your love, your joy, your understanding of the scriptures. You've built all of those things upon the church, which is the pillar and ground of all of these things. It's solid. It's established. And church ought to keep you established. Hebrews chapter 10. I was going to give you something from 2 Timothy 2. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Second Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the word, be instant, 
in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And this is how you are firm in the truth. Right? Not that I'm some, some beacon of truth in and of myself, but when we come together, we come together to sing, we come together to pray, we come together to hear primarily the preaching of the Word of God. This should be the, the focal point of the whole service. This is how the truth is portrayed to God's people. And God will speak to every one of you in a little bit different way today. He'll, he'll take something that I thought about that has application ABC, and he'll apply it to your heart in the XYZ. And I'll have no, no reason or way or manner of coming up with such a way of doing things. This is how God works. And his charge to me is that I preach the word in season when it's popular and out of season when it's not. When it's convenient, when it's not. When it when it's, goes with the status quo and when it doesn't. Yeah. And you do that with reproof. You do that with rebuke and you do that with exhortation. Those are the threefold ways that the scriptures come across. And they do it with patience and long-suffering and doctrine. I want to focus, reprove and rebuke, obviously, that's, that's, that's the firm and harsh dealing with error. But exhortation is a primary function of the church, and it's a, the second reason I believe that church is so important. It's the pillar and the ground of the truth. You want the truth? Come to where the truth is solid, and that's the church. The, the, the house of God, the church of the living God, that's the pillar and the ground of the truth. Exhortation, Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 23, the Bible says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Now, how is it that we don't waver? It, wa waver? As men, and I'll, and I'll admit it, when I, when I heard, like I said, that worldly explanation from the Baptist preacher, my heart sank. I'm like, oh no, I've made the wrong decision. But then I'm like, Ooh, what am I doing? No, back in the Bible, God said go to church. God said assemble, Right? I wavered because I put my faith in something other than, even for a moment, the Word of God. The Bible says, let us hold fast our profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. Consistency comes by putting our faith in He that promises such things, and as He is faithful, and as His promise comes across and can be trusted, so do you not waver. If you don't want to budge, put your faith and trust in him that promised. What did he promise? He promised to care for you. He promised to love you. He promised that a thousand shall fall at thy right hand, but the plague shall not come nigh thee. Amen. That's what God promised. That is, that is, whoa, mind blown. Okay? That, that speaks to us being out in public with thousands around us dropping dead and just... Right. Faithful is he that promised. Okay? Verse 24 says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, yeah, we can text one another and we can think of one another. We can pray for one another. But how much easier is it if we come together and in consideration one for another provoke one another to love and to good works? You know what goes a lot farther than praying for you, man, on a text? A punch in the shoulder. I'm praying for you, man. Let's pray now. That's exhortation to love and good works. Hey, stay in the fight. Hey, don't give up. Hey, get out there and get that gospel out. Right? Do these things that are needful according to the word of God. Stay at it, bro. Don't let this thing discourage you. Stay at it, sis. You can do it. You can take care of the house. You can, you can get through this. You don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to be concerned. And you provoke one another. Like I said, a, a, you know, a, a hug or a knock on the shoulder go a long ways. We get that here. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So we consider one another. We provoke one another to love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and unfortunate to say it, as the manner of some is. And how many? We were getting text messages. Everyone's closed. No one's congregating today. No one's in church today. I, I've never seen so many, so many blips in my, my, my Facebook feed of just like churches that 
weeks ago scoffed at live streaming that are just like, boom, we're live, boom, we're live, boom, we're live. These public servant announcements coming up from, coming up from the big wings of the Bible college. Hey, brother, let me teach you about how to preach to an empty room. It's bizarre. As their manner is, God says, don't do it. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. He is faithful that promise. What did he promise? Care for us. What did he promise? That if we were to stand as did Daniel when the law came down, he'll protect us from the mouth of those lions. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. And that's the thing. We're considering one another when we come together. We're provoking one another to love and to good works. We're exhorting one another. Being the only way that we're able to do such a thing is because we've come together. We've assembled together. Now we've seen, as we see, as we look, and, the, and we, we all thought it, that day is approaching. We ought to do this more and more and more. As we see this day. As the world gets crazier, I believe the church ought to get closer. As, as the world is going to and fro and being, being tossed about with their fear, the faith needs to grow stronger. Don't forsake the faith. Come together. Now, the world won't understand this, okay? They'll find our gathering revolting. They'll find our gathering uh, hurtful, harmful. Do you even care about the community? Because they don't understand, that doesn't mean that we don't have, we can't do what we do. I mean, we go and preach about a man who was God, who lived a sinless life, who died, was buried, rose again the third day, and men touched him before he went to heaven. Okay? They. Th they think that's nuts. And from a carnal perspective, without faith, of course, that's crazy. Why, how can you believe that? And now you're meeting together when there's this plague going on? Okay? Now, back in the Old Testament, there's the story of Hezekiah. And he, had, he had Sennacherib come to him, a representative of Sennacherib. And he came to the men that were in the wall. When they saw that they were going to be besieged by Sennacherib, people of Israel brought themselves in, and the first thing that they did was they stopped the fountains of living water. They stopped the water that was rushing, that was moving. And they said, lest our enemies should come, taste of this water and find this clean water, find this source of water. So the first thing that they did was they closed this off. Now the enemy was ignorant that this water was flowing inside. They came up and they would find dry beds of, of what used to be a creek, the remnant of it. Okay, but the people that were on the inside that were congregating, they knew that they had the fountains of living water. And so regardless of the fact that Sennacherib came and uh, he started to speak in the Hebrew tongue into the people and, and, and Hezekiah as the leader implored the world, hey, hey, quit talking to our people. Talk to me, let me filter it down to the people. Talk to me in, in your tongue, I understand it. And the, the blasphemous speech that came from Sennacherib by way of his messenger was, you know, are, are, are you, are you, I, I, came to, I came to this people, I didn't come to you, I came to the congregation. You've gathered them together that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss together. Your, your meeting is disgusting. Why are you doing this? You're spreading this filth. You're drinking filth. You're, you're basking in your own filth. This is dirty. This is unclean. You need to be sanitary. Right? That's what the world came and charged them with. They didn't know, though, that inside there was living water flowing freely. So they had everything they needed. They weren't, they weren't eating their own, drinking their own. They had living water. And that's the thing, is the world's going to doubt, and the world's going to be angry, and the world's going to think that this meeting is revolting just because they don't understand that we have living water in here, and that's why we're meeting. Amen. Uh, we purposely have it so. You know, 
I would much sooner, though I didn't disagree you know, with that, I would much sooner stop the flow of the living water going out there, stop the door-to-door -door soul winning, I would much sooner stop that than I would ever stop the church. Now that That's by picture, just stop the water, we're going to hunker down, we're going to be together as a congregation, we're going to meet together. The enemy's out there, they've been camped around about us, but hey, we've got living water here. I would much sooner stop that, but I haven't even stopped that. As our manner was aforetime, we're going to continue in that way. I, I don't know what else to do. I am not, I am not man enough to, to be an affront to God and say, I'm doing something else. i got a different plan. I'm going to cold call people from my bunker. If you die today, you should go to heaven. Come on, man. I'm trying to be gracious. <clears throat> go to Acts chapter 2. trying to be gracious and loving at the same time reprove, rebuke and exhort I saw Pastor Boyle talking about Christians that are in their basement with their pillows, their blankets up around their face hiding he's exactly right, he's got the same mentality that we have right now, there's a few that haven't bowed the knee to bow and bail they're saying we're going to meet Business as usual. We still got Acts 2020 mission for this year to plan, right? We may have to move some things around, do things a little bit differently, but the mission goes on. We continue in the things that we had set forth to do. <clears throat> Jesus says, abide in me, right? We're to abide in the vine. Even so, church connects us to the power source that is Christ. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Okay? It's hard to get away from that. They were all with one accord in one place. There's no getting around this. They were all, all of them, with one accord in one singular place. Look back in verse uh, 24 of the previous chapter. And they prayed and said... Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two men thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. Who's the one sneaking away to his own place? Who's the one? We know that's hell. We know that's damnation. We know that that's, that's the result of his sins and not believing on Christ. But man, I just see the, the connection made that the congregations of an, with one accord and they're connected to the power supply and they're about to have a great action from God and the one that betrayed our Lord and Savior and died in his sins is the one that goes to his own place instead. Verse 2 it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice, all came with one accord. All gathered in the same place, and all were filled with that same Holy Ghost because they were present. I believe that some that chose not to be present that day didn't receive of that. Notice, I don't want to be harsh to... God's people that have done according to what, what is, has always been our manner. If you're sick, stay home. If you don't feel well, stay home. If you think that you're of high risk, stay home. This has always been the case. We're not legalists in that fashion, okay? So I'm not trying to say that somebody who's not here, who's used to sit beside you, is now not receiving of the Holy Ghost. It's not my intention at all. But what I am saying is that the mandate that comes that tries to get everybody separate from the congregation of God, right, wherever that comes from, is ungodly. It is not righteous. It is not what God intends. God intends for God's people to come together as much as possible, and so much the more as we see that day approaching. Now, this was all done in fulfillment of what had happened in the previous chapter, Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, where the Bible reads, And being assembled together with them, 
commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. And so Christ is assembled with his church here, and the command he gives them is, keep assembling until this promise comes. And in verse 8 it says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Samaria, and in all Judea, sorry, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, the promise was made. God said, hey, we're assembled together, I'm going to go away, but you stay assembled, and I will send my comforter who will give you power from on high. That Holy Ghost will give you power to be witnesses unto me. So, why is church so important? First of all, it's the pillar and ground of the church. Truth, sorry, it's a place for exhortation. We also get reprove and rebuke here, of course. It's a place that connects us to the power source, which is the Holy Spirit of God. We need to, we need to get here all assembled, all in one place to get the uttermost of the Spirit placed upon us, I believe. Okay? You can be a Spirit-filled believer out there on your own. Look at Elijah. You can be a Spirit-filled believer out on your own. Look at Philip. You can be a Spirit-filled believer, but you know what all these guys had in common? Their base was the congregation. Amen. They met here first, then they went out. They met here first, they prayed, they sung, they exhorted, they loved the Savior, and then they went out and took part of the ministry that he had for them out in the world. Acts chapter 2, verse 5 and 6 says, And there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Verse 11, it says, Cretes and Arabians, after that long list. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So the next reason why the church is so great and wonderful and why it's needful and why it's essential to the believer is that it gives us the power to go. Okay, we get that power and it's great to, to, to get that spirit in us, get full of the Holy Ghost by speaking to ourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and as a congregation coming together and rejoicing in that and hearing the preaching and getting filled up. But it's all to the end that we would go in the power that we are given. And even so we see here, they received of the promise of the Father as they congregated together, all with one accord, all in one place, all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they went they out to the world to preach unto them. That's the purpose of the church coming together, to get charged to go and be Philip the Evangelist, to get charged to go and be the preachers of old who have done the same thing. Verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And that is the church in a nutshell that we need to be doing more as we see that day approaching. Fellowship, doctrine, breaking bread, prayers, fellowship, doctrine, breaking bread, prayers, fellowship, doctrine, breaking bread, prayers, continuing steadfastly in it. We're given power to go. I believe we're also given power to continue in those things. And without church, I promise you, you'll quit the fight. Without the exhortation of the body, you will give up. Without coming together and fellowshipping, you will not live the Christian life in the same power and authority given you by the Holy Spirit as if you did. Amen. You know what's going to happen to all these internet fundamental Baptists out there? They're going to have the internet cut off, and then what? If their solid ground, if their rock, if their pillar is the world wide web and the preaching coming to them via that, if that goes, so does their faith. Amen. If that goes, no fellowship. They never had fellowship to begin with. If that goes, they will get out of the fight. God gives us the church. To be the pillar and ground, the source of the truth. Our home base, base camp, right? He gives it to us so that we come here and hear the preaching of the word. We're reproved, we're rebuked, we're exhorted, and so that we wouldn't waver. We would be trusting in the God that promised the words that we're hearing. 
He gave us the church that we be, can be connected to the power source of the Holy Ghost. There's something special about all God's people coming all together of one accord into one place. The power enters into us and we can take it with us. We're given power to go. Not only so, we're given power to continue so that we don't quit when things get rough. We don't quit when a plague is nigh to us. We don't quit when the whole world is disagreeing with our congregation, our meeting right now. When people are thinking we're being selfish. It's not selfish to go and serve your Savior. They just can't see Him, so they don't believe in Him, so they don't think that we would ever be, be justified in coming to stand before Him. We serve our Savior, and that is not selfish. That's, in fact, selfless. Do you know what my flesh wanted to do today? To call in and say, you know what? I'm just going to stay home. Let's cancel church. Hey, the whole world's doing it. Might as well. Man, when, that, when, when my son came in with two knees, did like a cannonball on my stomach, uh -huh. man, I just wanted to like put him back to bed and roll over and just get another couple hours of Z's in there. But no, look, I don't. I, I, I don't have the wherewithal to make that kind of decision. I'm not acting by coming to church. I didn't decide to come to church today. Let's put it that way. It's a response. It's simply a reflex. But Sunday, we're going to church. Sunday, we're going to church. Sunday, we're going to church. It's, 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 it's not something that I have to sit and hum and haw about. Just as when the decree came that for 30 days, Daniel, you're only going to ask requests of the king. For 30 days, Daniel, you need to, you need to, um, you know, you need to just pray unto me and that's it. Daniel decided long ago that he would not be partaker of the king's meat, that three times a day he would pray and seek his God. And when the decree came out, the decisions that were made of Daniel years ago became the reflexes of the moment when the petition was signed. The Bible records Daniel that when he knew that the decree was signed, he did as he did aforetime. There's no decrees out there, but there's strong warnings. You want to think of, of these strong warnings? I think of it like when, when I ask Caleb, hey, can, can you please pick that up that you just dropped? And then he doesn't, and I'm kind of like, I wasn't really asking you. <laughs> that, that's, that's the government asking us nicely to not be in church. Hey, can you please not congregate when we don't? I wasn't really asking you. I tried that freedom thing. I tried that asking politely thing. And then the gavel falls. And they do it by force. So we need to be found faithful. God's going to bless us if we just didn't waver. If we just kept doing what we're doing. But I've, I've thought to myself, how in the world are you going to turn back when, when you've said okay for two weeks we're not going to assemble in church and then in two weeks if God wills they lift it and say you can again I don't know that's going to happen but how do you get back into it what if they say no 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 four weeks no 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 eight weeks no 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 just, just keep it going keep it going to February keep it going don't, don't meet don't meet up don't meet up right at what point do you have to now change your mind and get back into the fight that you left when you said no I don't want to do that. I want to just be found in the same fashion two weeks ago as I was today. Consistency in the Christian life is pivotal. You have, you have to, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. You have to be resolved. I am resolved. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I'm not wavering. I'm not faltering. I'm not failing. There is a narrow road before me. It's straight as an arrow, and I'm after that. The prize is set before me. I am not turning away to the left hand or to the right. You have to just set your mind to that thing. And the Bible says if there first be a willing mind, is it accepted according to the Savior? He accepts that. You have decided and said, I am not turning back. I am resolved. I am pressing on. And, 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 and don't waver. And if you decide those things now, then when there comes a opposition that wants to deter you, I've already decided long ago, and now it's just a reflex. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, keep doing what I'm doing, keep doing what I'm doing, keep doing what I'm doing. In a time when they are 
They are feigning that they want to cancel the congregation of God's people. They say they're, they, they want us to not assemble. They want us to not gather. They want us to not meet. They want us to not go to church. I am resolved to go. This isn't a decision that I sat down and contemplated. Now, I will say that when I let the world start talking to me, I, I wavered. I had doubts. I had fears creep in. But when I get myself centered back on to the scriptures and what it says, I know that this is not a decision that is up to me. Amen. I need to, by reflex, by impulse, do what God says. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, so much the more as you see the day approaching. It may not always look like it does right now. We may be in a different setting. We may be in a different place. We may be scattered abroad as the believers in Jerusalem were. They always found opportunity to come together and meet together. Receive great power for doing it. It's not a decision. It's a reflex. It's an impulse. It's, it's being resolved to follow God and letting nothing sway you from that. I've decided to do that. I pray that you'd all do likewise. I pray that some of, the, some of the believers out there who are wavering and who are succumbing to the requests, just repent. I'm not some, some awesome soldier, servant of God. I'm not some great man, okay? But, but I serve a great God. Amen. And he wants me to just do something as simple as meet with his people. Amen. Okay? The world's going to make that complicated and difficult and challenging and hard and so much the more. I don't know if you've ever seen clips of like Chinese underground churches where they slide a cupboard and then go into an apartment that's under another apartment and they all meet and sing hymns. Like, they congregate. If you tell them now that they can't, they're going to take death. I thank you, Father, Lord, for your word. I pray, God, that you would give us the resolve to, to follow through with the decisions that we make today, Lord. Help us to all look inwardly and, and, and decide personally that no matter what the world says, God, respectfully, living peaceably with all men and as much as in us is, Lord, we would to God that, that we could live a quiet and peaceful life, that the, that the things would get back in order. I could go back to my day job. I love my job. I, I can go back to just just uh, baseball practices and, and you know riding a bike and going to my work and coming home playing with my family in the park. And age. Would to God everything would just go back to the way it was, right? But if it doesn't, Lord, help us to be resolved to stand steadfast in the things that you have made clear in your word. The pillar on the ground of the truth was purchased with your blood, Father, through your Son Jesus Christ. I believe it's important to you, and uh, I'm telling you today, it's important to me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.